And Father, we declare today that our allegiance is to you, to that name, to the name of Jesus the Christ, who is Lord of heaven and earth. We thank you, Father, that it is a great privilege to serve you, the living God of the universe who has power uh, over the flames. We thank you that you have rescued us from the dominion of darkness. You have transferred us into the kingdom of the Son whom you love. And we thank you that the second death has no power over us. We thank you, Father, that as we endure trials and opposition and difficulties in this world, that we cling to the very promises of God, which include your promise that you will never leave us, you will never forsake us. And Lord, as we enter into this great passage of Daniel 3, that is known so well by the church, I pray, Father, that you would remind us that you are the one who gives permission of the fire. Uh, You are the one who is present with us in the fire. You are the one who has power over the fire, and you will get praise over the fire. And so, Lord, uh, today we pray that you would now take your word uh, as a Bible-directed church. Would you sow this, uh, this story deep within our hearts that we would stand firm in our convictions and trust you with the outcome. And we pray all this in the name of Jesus, who is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And all God's people said. Amen. Amen. New Hope. Thank you. You may be seated. Uh, Thank our worship team uh, with your round of applause uh, just as a way to say thank you, Pastor Rick and team. A joy to have you here with us in person. Thank you for dedicating and prioritizing the household of God in your weekly worship. And we also welcome those who are uh, worshiping with us in the online community, including our campus in Bel Air, Michigan, and homes all throughout Michigan, as well as other states in the United States. Would you uh, welcome them with your applause and say greetings to all of you in Jesus' name. Well, as a church, we are Bible-directed. Uh, we are a people that is Bible-directed, so that's why we take God's Word, and you can take God's Word and turn to Daniel chapter 3 uh, this morning. Uh, we are also a church that is uh, prayer-driven. We do believe that prayer is the first work of ministry. And as promised, we have a 40-day prayer guide for you to help us pray for the youth ministry. If you start tomorrow and join us on this 40-day pr- of prayer, you will, it will take us all the way through Christmas Eve. Uh, we have daily prayer guides uh, or a prayer guide for you. You can take your bulletin and uh, scan the QR code and pull up the daily prayer prompts, or you can get a hard copy after the service. Or if you're in the online community, you can look under watch and read and click down the menu and find the 40-day prayer guide. Here's what I'm challenging you to do. I want you to join me in praying for the youth ministry for the next 40 days. And as a very uh, micro, uh, bite-sized way to do this, I want you to take the daily prayer prompts and would you consider giving five minutes a day in prayer? Now, I had a godly man tell me this week that that's an ambitious goal, but I'm challenging you because we are not an ordinary church. I think you can pray for five minutes a day for our youth ministry so that the ministry of our youth would be permeated by prayer. And so it's a great way to do this. Uh, This is just a practical uh, little uh, action step. Uh, If you take the daily prayer prompt to pray for our youth ministry, uh, you can call somebody Call a friend who is equally committed to pray and simply pray over that daily prayer need and you will be amazed how fast five minutes will go when you invest seeds of prayer for our youth ministry. So thank you on behalf of the church, not only for giving generously uh, to build and complete the youth ministry center, but also to invest seeds of prayer. Now, Uh, I saw a picture this week. Uh, It was in a magazine called Voice of the Martyrs, which is dedicated uh, to raise awareness of the persecuted church around the world. And so every month they have issues. And they had a picture of three guys. uh, And uh, this is Nagasi, Ephraim, and Dina. And uh, these three guys, I'm telling you, are modern day Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. What God did in their life is such an awesome story. You gotta hear it. You ready for the story? Okay, you got to wait till the end of the service. But um, that's an awesome story. And you're going to hear about a modern day Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who are persevering, standing firm in the midst of opposition, and they are standing firm in their faith in the living God and refusing to compromise in the midst of a very dangerous Ethiopian culture. But for now, we turn our attention to Daniel chapter 3. Now, even if you're not a uh, football fan or maybe a Big Ten football fan, uh, perhaps you have heard of the term uh, the 12th man. 
the 12th man. If you're not familiar with football, just picture this. You're in the stands and on the field are 11 players. That is 11 versus 11. And so they are pouring blood and sweat and tears and they're laboring uh, for the victory. Uh, But the term the 12th man refers to the crowd, the home crowd. That is the fans that are in the stadium that are cheering on their team. And the 12th man is known to have a decisive impact on the outcome of the game. So they're called the 12th man. The first usage of that phrase came from Big Ten football back in the 1900. It was the Minnesota Gophers. And an article said, referred to the mysterious influence of what? The 12th man on the team, that is the Rooter. It was again used in 1912 from the Iowa Hawkeyes. And the Iowa uh, article said the 11 man had done their best. But the 12th man on the team, the loyal, spirited Iowa Rooter had won the game. So it's the power of the 12th man. But the biggest impact or the biggest uh, uh, of time that the phrase became modernized and uh, and used uh, at great extents in our culture uh, was 100 years ago this year. It was in the 1921-1922 football season, and it came from way down south in the land of Texas. That is Texas A&M, the Aggies. And it's a fascinating story where the home of the 12th man was birthed. It was at a point in the game where the Aggies uh, were, had, had so many injuries on the team that one more injury would have left them without a substitute to go in the game. Imagine that. No more substitutes. And so the coach of the, of the Aggies, his name right here is uh, Dana Bible. True story, last name Bible. Dana Bible looks up into the stands and he sees a sophomore. It was a 20-year-old Aggie sophomore, not a football player named E. King Gill. And he calls him down from the stands and he tells him to put on a football uniform and get ready to go in the game. Now, it would be like me coming down to you and saying, hey, get ready to preach just in case Craig has an injury. (laughs) So just imagine you're getting ready. Now, in Aggie history, as the story would go, E. King Gill never went in the game, but it was that moment in Aggie history that the spirit of the 12th man was born. And now for 100 years, Uh, The Aggies called themselves, here it is, they called themselves the home of the 12th man. They built a statue on their campus of E. King Gill to show that they were spirited and willing to go in the game at any moment. And they even have the website called 12thman.com. It's the spirit of the 12th man. Now here it is. Daniel chapter three. The spirit of the fourth man is born. It is the mysterious influence of the fourth man that after three men have been on the field, standing firm in their convictions, refusing to compromise and and persevering in the midst of their faith and being delivered over to the flames at the very moment that it appears Babylon has won the victory, all of a sudden, we're gonna see today, there's a massive turn of events a reversal of events. And it's all because of this mysterious influence of the fourth man who enters the field of play, strengthens the three, rescues from the, uh, rescues from the flames and gets the glory over Babylon. I would have loved uh, to read the headlines in the Babylon B newspaper the next day. I imagine the headlines would have said something like this. Then came the mysterious influence of the fourth man. And another article, the three Jewish boys had done their best, but the fourth man won the victory. It is this moment in the scripture, penned for all of history, for all of time, that would teach the people of God of the mysterious influence of the fourth man. There is no place in the Old Testament that we get a clearer window into the divine presence of Jesus Christ, who is eternal with the Father, who makes an appearance right here as the mysterious figure of the fourth man who comes to rescue and quench the spirit of the flames and delivers from death, and it delivers a lesson to believers for all of ages. Here it is. There is another one in the fire with us. There is a God who is with us in the midst of flames. 
There is a God who stands with us, who rescues, who quenches the flames, who delivers from death. There is a God who has authority and power over heaven and hell and death and dominion. He has all authority. And this is the purpose of this passage. So as we enter the story, here is just that brief little background because if you're brand new with us, we're jumping in right at the moment of crisis where they're being thrown into the flames. So let's rewind real quick. Uh, First sermon two weeks ago. A political crisis happens where the political regime of Babylon orders people to bow before a statue. And it forces a crisis because people that have biblical convictions have to choose between compromising with a culture or standing firm in their convictions, but the consequence would be death. Last week, the second sermon, the political crisis gets very personal as we're introduced to three characters. Help me out. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These are three men who stood firm in their convictions, refused to compromise. They trusted themselves to the God of creation who they knew had power over the flames. He had power to deliver, but even if God chose not to deliver, they would not bow. And it reminded us, and it called attention to one of the greatest passages in the scripture when they looked at the king of Babylon and they said, O king, Our God is able to deliver from the fire and he will deliver. But even if he doesn't, let it be known, O king, that we will not bow down and worship you. And so it was that bold conviction, that bold defiance that led to fatal consequences. And I just wanna just pause right here because I know that this story is big and it's grandiose, but I'm telling you, church, God has written this story for your encouragement. So as you think right now of what is your greatest trial, what is your greatest adversity, what is the greatest uh, thing that is coming against you that is threatening to swallow up your faith? Perhaps you're like one online viewer who wrote me a note this week who has been canceled by longtime friends over issues, and they've also been canceled by their daughter because of their uh, convictions of Jesus as Lord. Maybe you're like that person who is enduring opposition and adversity and being canceled in the midst of culture. Listen, whatever your adversity, I want you to know this, that there's a God in heaven who is with you in the fire. And the story today will remind us of these four things. He permits the fire. He is present with you in the fire. He has power over the fire. And at the end of the day, he will get praise after the fire. So let's go through the story. We join with these three boys right at the moment of crisis. And we see his permission of the fire. The focus today is on the fourth man. And right from the get-go, we see that this mysterious fourth man gives permission to enter the trial. Here it is, verse 19. Then Nebuchadnezzar was filled with fury and the expression of his face was changed. Can you picture that? The fury, the anger, because they did not obey his order. His face changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He ordered the furnace heated seven times hotter, more than it was usually heated. Verse 20. And he ordered some of the mighty men of his army uh, to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to cast them into the flames. Verse 21, then these men were bound in their cloaks, their tunics, their hats, and other garments, and they were thrown into the burning, fiery furnace. Verse 22, because the king's order was urgent and the furnace overheated like his attitude, right? The flame of the fire killed those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Verse 23, and these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell bound into the burning, fiery furnace. Powerful story. It's the moment of crisis. And notice very clearly here in this story that the three godly young men who stood firm in their convictions were not exempt from the trial. They were not delivered from the flames initially. 
The Lord did not intervene. The Lord could have intervened before, but here is three men who were, uh, who were not exempt from the trials. They were cast in, they were bound, they were sent into the flames. Now, Nebuchadnezzar, uh, this is truly overkill, right? If there's ever been a situation in which there was an overkill, this was it. His anger burned hotter than the fire and the furnaces of Babylon, which were intended for smelting metals, aluminum, silver, whatever, copper, bronze, uh, gold, the furnaces which were used for melting and smelting uh, uh, metals are also serving now a secondary purpose. And that is a crematorium for Jews. Boy, where have we heard about that in history? History repeats itself with the Nazi regime back in World War II, undoubtedly inspired by this story. This is how Babylon dealt with Jews who they considered dangerous or rebellious. And the king orders three men into the furnace. Now, the normal temperature of the furnace would have done the trick. The normal temp would have killed the three. Does that make sense? But the king who is given to extremes orders it to be heated seven times hotter. I think it's just a way to to flex his muscles. It was an attempt to say, these Jews are going to be incinerated. Cremation happens at 1800 degrees Fahrenheit. And so this would leave them nothing but dust. And this was his order. The point is not to evaluate the temperature of the furnace, but it is to show the utter impossibility of survival. The flames are so hot that even the executioners that are taken up die just from getting too close to the flames. And when they die, the three men fall into the fire bound. Realize this, New Hope. There's a God in heaven who in his wisdom and his power and his authority gives permission for his people to enter the fire. I know sometimes you don't like it. Sometimes it's very difficult. Sometimes you wonder how long and the duration of the trial will last. But there is a God in heaven who permits the trial. Action step number one at this point is to recognize when you're in a fiery trial, surrender completely to the plan of God. Surrender. Take your life and your situation and hold it open-handedly. Do you realize, New Hope, that every day we live in a, in, in, we have to live in that daily tension. And the daily tension of faith is the same tension that these three boys lived in. The last words that they said before the flames were this, and you know them. Our God is able. Our God is able to deliver us from the flames. He has power. He has authority. He rules as the king of the universe. And so we believe with all of our hearts that he is able to deliver. And yet at the same time is the back end of that statement. But even if he, what? Even if, even if he doesn't, let it be known, O king, that we will not bow and serve you. So every day we live with the biblical tension that there's a God in heaven who can rescue us. But even if he doesn't, we are surrendered completely to his will, to his plan, to his ways. Now, am I the only control freak here? Or do some of you want to control uh, the outcome? You want to control the duration. You want to control when you go in. You want to control when you come out. You want to control other drivers. You want to control your spouse. You want to control this. You want to control that. And some of you even want to control God. There comes a moment, and this is a gift to you if you're brand new to the faith in Jesus Christ to recognize that trials are bound to come. And I believe it is this moment in the scripture that causes Peter later to write to the church and warn them that opposition and trials are coming. And he writes to the church these words, and we just studied it this summer. Do not be surprised at the fiery trial that is coming as though something strange were happening to you but rather rejoice in so far as you share in Christ's sufferings that the glory of God may be revealed. This is what's going on in Daniel 3. They are surrendered completely to the will, to the plan of God. 
and they recognize that there's a God in heaven who permits the fire, but somehow, some way, as they share in the sufferings of the living God, that his glory will be revealed. That is what they cling to. Do you realize that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did not know how the story would end at this point? Daniel 3 had not been written, but they lived by faith in the living God who permits the fire, and yet they trusted their souls to their creator. That is the first step. Recognize next church is his presence, his presence in the fire. Greatest moment of the story is the mysterious presence of the fourth man. Here it is, verse 24. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished. Why? And he rose up in haste. Why? Uh, well, he declared to his, who? Very fascinating, his counselors. Now, a little side note here. Uh, I've got a, a few emails this week from people. Where is Daniel in the story? <laughs> Truth be known, we just don't know. However, what we do know is that Daniel had been promoted to be his chief counselor. And so right here in the story, perhaps, perhaps, Daniel is gathered now with the king, watching his three friends go into the flames. And Nebuchadnezzar gathers his counselors and he asks them, here's the question, did we not cast, what? Three men bound into the fire? And they answered and said to the king, true, O king. Verse 25, he answered and said, but I see four men unbound, walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt. And the appearance of the fourth is like what? A son of the gods. Amen. New hope. Here's the turning point. The three men are not alone. Only three went in, but there's a fourth. And it's the presence of the fourth man that changes the outcome of the game. Everything that was going was moving in the direction of a Babylon victory. And then the fourth man comes, <laughs> the fourth man, and everything changes. Now, what's marvelous about this is that God actually gives Nebuchadnezzar a gift. And the gift that he gives him is he gives him eyes to see a spiritual reality that has been true all along. And the reality is, is there's a God in heaven who will never leave us or forsake us. For just a window of time, his eyes are open to the divine reality that these three men are not alone. In fact, there has been a fourth man with them all along. Do you realize? To rewind the story, at the moment that these three men stood firm in their convictions and refused to bow to the government order, do you realize that there was a fourth man standing with them? And in the process of standing on trial before the king, as those three men stood there under accusation and penalty of death, that they were not alone, but the fourth man was standing with them. And as they were being marched towards the flames, that it wasn't just three men being marched, but there was a fourth man with them, a mysterious influence, a presence of the Lord. And now as they're in the flames, the eyes of Nebuchadnezzar are open to see a divine reality of what has been true all along. And that is this, that the living God is with his people. He is present in the flames. Action step number two. When you're in a fiery trial, abide peacefully in the presence of God. Abide means rest. Rest peacefully. Rest comfortably. Recognize that there's a God in heaven who is faithful to his promises. And his promises is, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Now, for those of you who know the scripture, and many of you love the scripture, you memorize passages, and there's certain promises that you hold to, that you cling to in times of trials. Isn't that true? That, that when you're facing trials, that there's things that you cling to as true in the midst of the fire. For instance, let's say you're in the middle of a fire, the middle of a testing, and, and you have to recognize that God is doing this for some greater purpose. You may call to mind James. Count it all Joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds because you know the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. 
Or you may be concerned that maybe God has left you. And so you call to mind uh, the scripture, which says to cast your anxieties to the Lord because he cares for you. Or you may be doubting the outcome of the trial. And so you call to mind the scripture that says that we know that in all things, God works together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Do you have a promise that you cling to? Let me tell you back in the story. As these three men were headed towards the flames, they were just like us. And I almost bet you, I would bet you a sandwich at McDonald's or Burger King. I would bet you that they had a promise of God from the scripture that they were meditating upon. It was written in the scripture about 130 years before them by a guy, maybe you've heard of him, his name is Isaiah. Isaiah would have been well known. These men would have been well studied in the words of Isaiah, their predecessor. And I believe as they were marching towards the flames that they were meditating upon the presence of God being with them in the midst, no matter the outcome, no matter, the, no matter what would happen, they were committed to the promise of God and his word that he would never leave them nor forsake them. And New Hope, when I show you this verse that I believe that they must have been meditating upon, it is the verse of scripture that I have been praying for you all week long. And that verse that I believe these three boys were clinging to was this, Isaiah 43. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. Read this with me. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned and the flame shall not consume you. Isn't that beautiful? For I am the Lord, your God, your savior. And here are those three men bound, headed towards the flames, remembering God is present with us in the fire. He will never leave us. He will never forsake us. As the flames get hotter and hotter and as they're dropping in, just think about that. And, and, and then there they are, not hurt by the flames. Could you imagine, wouldn't you like to just ask them, what was that like? You're there in the furnace. And perhaps they would testify to Isaiah 42 or Isaiah 43 as being the concrete promise of God's word that God was faithful to deliver us from the fire. New hope, God permits the fire, but he is present in the fire. And notice this, his protection from the fire or his power over the fire. Verse 26, then Nebuchadnezzar came near the door of the burning fiery furnace. He declared, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the most high God, come out and come here. Well, that's a good idea, right? I want to talk to you. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out from the fire, verse 27. And the uh, congressional leaders, this is what they are, the satraps, prefects, and governors, and the king's counselors. So all of the political leadership together uh, came together and saw, <laughs> uh, this is awesome, the fire had not had any power over the bodies of these men. The hair of their heads was not singed, their cloaks were not harmed, and no smell of fire had come upon them. Isn't that amazing? The flames had no power. Uh, not even the smell of smoke. Notice very clearly, God did not abandon them to death or decay or incineration. The power of the flames had no authority over them had no authority over their bodies, had no authority over their clothes, had no authority over their hair. Uh, this is an amazing, who is this God? Who is the God who can quench the fury of the flames, who can deliver from death, who can rescue his people from incineration? Who is this God? Well, new hope, it is the living God of Christ Jesus the Lord. It is the mysterious presence of the fourth man who enters into the fire and delivers us out of the fire. This, by the way, is why new hope exists. We exist because that guy is risen. He's risen. 
He reverses decay. He rises up bodily. His body is not delivered over. It is not given over. The power of death has no authority over him. And so when he's raised from the dead and he's exalted to the right hand of the Father, it is no wonder why the New Testament authors rejoice because Christ Jesus our Lord has reversed decay. He is not decaying in the ground. He has risen bodily. And so guess what? They begin to celebrate, not just that Jesus is risen. Notice very clearly that he, does, he, he is not decaying. Acts chapter two and chapter 13. Notice, he was not abandoned to the grave, nor did his body see what? Decay. Acts 13, God raised him from the dead, never to decay. The one whom God raised from the dead did not see what? Decay. New hope, listen. Listen. What was true of Christ at the resurrection will be true of you. The Lord will not deliver you over to the flames. He will rescue you out of them. You will be raised bodily, triumphantly, gloriously to the praise of his glory. It is the hope of resurrection. Action step number three. When you're in a fiery trial, look confidently to the promises of God, chief of which is the resurrection of eternal glory. We serve a God of resurrection hope. Just as Christ has been raised, so you too shall be raised. This is the great hope of eternal promise that there is life after death, that we will rise in bodily glory, that the Lord will not deliver us over, that the second death has no authority over us, that we will not decay forever, but the Lord himself will raise us up bodily you realize that that is, that is what we look confidently to in moments of grief and sorrow. When, lost, when loved ones are lost, as fate would have it, and I say fate, I just mean simply as God would have it done. It was two weeks ago after this service, right back there, I met a couple. We've known each other for several years now. They're from Florida, Steve and Diane, godly couple young, healthy, retired, strong. And he gives me a business card, invites us down to Vero Beach where they live. And, and uh, his business card said he's an ambassador for Jesus. I just love the guy. Loves Jesus with all of his heart, mind, soul, and strength. And who would have thought that this past Thursday, Steve would drop dead suddenly. A young, strong, healthy man, leaving behind a widow. But I'm telling you, in the midst of the grief and the sorrow and the loss of that, of that sudden and unexpected loss, I'm telling you, church, listen, we as a church look confidently ahead to the promises of God that the Lord will not give him over to the power of the flames, but will rescue him out of it. Church, that is the hope of resurrection glory. And this is what Daniel points us to. And this is what Nebuchadnezzar is in awe of. Who is this God who has authority over the flames? New hope, the second death, has no authority over us. Notice his praise after the fire. Verse 28, Nebuchadnezzar answered and said, blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants who trusted in him and set aside the king's command and yielded up their bodies rather than serve and worship any other God. Do you just marvel at this? Here's a political leader, one of the most wicked and cruel people ever to grace this planet. And he's in such awe that he he praises the God of creation. Now that's, that's good but you realize that he's a man of extremes. He's a little crazy. He probably a little lunatic. And so now he goes to the other extreme. This is, this is marvelous. Therefore, I make a decree. Here it is. Another executive order. Let's see if he gets this one right. Any people, nation, or language that speaks anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be torn limb from limb and their houses laid in ruins for there is no other God who is able to rescue in this way. (laughs) Listen, we don't applaud his temper, uh, but we certainly applaud his testimony. 
His testimony is there is no other God who can do what that God just did. That is the testimony of a king who stands in awe at the praise and the glory of the one who is do it all. And that is the living God of Israel, the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Action step, here it is. When you're in a fiery trial, testify boldly about the power of God. New hope, no other God can do what our God can do. It was Pastor Erwin Lutzer who said it this way, never underestimate the power of your individual witness. And New Hope, I just wanna tell you, wherever you're at in life, whatever the struggle, whatever the adversity, whatever the pressure coming against you in culture, never underestimate, never underestimate what God can do through a faithful man or woman of God who remains firm in their convictions and trusts the Lord with the outcome and gives it all for the praise of his glory. Never underestimate that. Never underestimate the influence. Never underestimate the power, the glory that God of the universe can work through you to give him the praise on the biggest platforms of your life. Never underestimate that. When your convictions are tested with compromise, never underestimate the power of the living God to enter into the fire and to showcase his glory. He is able to do far exceedingly more than you could ever ask, think, or imagine. To him belongs the glory forever and ever. So this is the picture. Three men who not long ago were wicked men. They were not followers of Jesus. This guy was in witchcraft. This guy was in witchcraft. And this guy beat up his neighbor and all three of them went to prison. Let me tell you their story. Nagasi, we'll call him Shadrach, how about that? Uh, Shadrach was in witchcraft. He hated Christians, made fun of them, called them derogatory names, but he cheated a man out of the money using his witchcraft, and so he was sent to prison. In prison, he began to read a Bible, didn't really believe it, but God showed up in a dream, and in the dream, the Lord convicted his heart that salvation is found in no one else than the name of Jesus Christ. He wakes up from the dream, he opens a Bible, he reads the gospel, and he comes face to face with a recognition that Jesus is indeed the Lord of heaven and earth, and he surrenders his life to Jesus in prison. What does he do? (laughs) He begins to tell everybody in prison about Jesus who can set them free from sin. Well, that wasn't received real well. (laughs) Inmates wanted nothing to do with this story. They started to complain and threaten and Uh, and then they told the guards, and the guards told Shadrach to shut up. Well, he didn't. He continued to testify and proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord of heaven and earth. And so the guards were fed up and furious, and they transferred him off to a max security cell jail with shackles around his legs. And how many know that the word of God is not in chains? So there he is in a max security cell. Enter character number two, Ephraim, also in witchcraft, cheated a man out of money, and he was sent to prison, and he was transferred to a new cell with a new roommate, that guy's cell. Shadrach began to share with, we're gonna call him Meshach. Shadrach began to share with Meshach about the good news of a savior who can set free from sin and death and set us free from shackles. Meshach wanted nothing to do with the story. He complained to the guards. The guards told Shadrach to stop sharing the news about Jesus. Did he share? Did he stop? No. He continued to share the good news. And finally, Meshach was convicted to the heart when he heard the words of Jesus. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. And there in the jail cell, Meshach gave his life to Jesus. And now there were two committed to the gospel of Jesus and sharing with everybody that there's a savior who can set you free from sin and death. Well, that was met with oppositions and threats by the inmates who continued to complain to the guards and the guards would tell them, stop talking about Jesus. And so finally they took the main guy, Shadrach, And they sent him down into the pit that is solitary confinement where there is no light, it is complete darkness. And how many know that the light of God's word can penetrate even the deepest of darkness? And so here he is sitting in solitary confinement, enter character number three. The guards would send Dinah, who was in prison for beating up his neighbor. They would send him down to check on Shadrach every now and then just to see how he was doing. 
And guess what? Every time Abednego went to visit, he would hear the good news of a savior who can set free from sin and death. He wanted to follow Jesus, but here is the deal. He was so afraid of persecution and trials and suffering. He didn't know if it was worth it. But at that moment, Shadrach told him, listen, Abednego, there is a God in heaven who is worth following even in the midst of suffering, death, threats, and opposition. And so after counting the cost, Abednego surrendered his life to Jesus Christ, and now there were three. And God used the, bound, uh, the, the, the friendship of these three, of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, to begin to share Christ and win prisoner after prisoner. 15 prisoners would come to faith in Jesus Christ until they were finally released, <laughs> like, get out of here, right? And when they went out, and they were finally set free. The threats and the opposition of a very intensely Muslim government continued to press against them very personally. And it was one night, one night. Remember this guy, Abednego? Very concerned about persecution and opposition. Well, it was one night. He went back to his village and there was threats that turned into violence against his family. He's out in the field uh, sleeping one night with his cows, because his cows were sick, he was tending to sick cows when he woke to smelling fire. He runs back to the village to find that his home uh, is on fire with his wife and children inside and, and the door is bound shut. Evil men had locked it shut from the outside so that nobody inside could escape. He was able to break into the door and rescue his wife and his children just in time before they came out and they watched the entire house burn to the ground. And it's in that moment that he recognizes Jesus is worth it all. He testifies then to the magazine, and here's what we read in his words. We read these words. I was not upset when my home was destroyed because I knew the Lord had led me to sleep with my cows to be able to save my family. As I was watching my house burn, the story of Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego came to my mind. The same thing happened to me. They were asking me to worship another God and I said no. So they tried to convince me with fire. But our real home is in heaven. They only burn my earthly house. He goes on, he says this, my life belongs to God and I believe he put me here. I don't know why he wants me to stay here, but I believe he is working. If he allows me to be killed, I am ready to die. If he wants to save the entire village, then I have to just be patient. Worship team, come on up. He ends this way. Jesus died in the open on the cross, not underground. So I want to die in the open. That is the ultimate expression of the gospel. This is good news. New hope. Daniel 3 is such a magnificent story. Let me boil it down as you're gonna hear right now in song, there's another in the fire. There's another in the fire. He is present with you. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. And he is worth whatever opposition comes your way. His name is Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we cling with comfort and confidence to that truth, that there is another in the fire. I pray that you would take that very simple and clear truth and now minister to the hearts of your people. Encourage them to remain faithful in the fire. We pray in Jesus' name. Well, to those of you in our online family, thank you for worshiping with us today. We know that many of you are walking through fiery trials, and I am praying that today's sermon is an encouragement that you are not alone in the fire. There is another in the fire with you. Our Lord is with you. He has permitted the fire. He is present in the fire, and he has promised to be faithful in the fire. We do covet your prayers for us, our leadership, and our ministry, especially for uh, our youth. Uh, the funds for the Youth Center have been generously and fully provided, and now we ask you to join us in the first work of ministry, and that is prayer. We ask you to join us in the next 40 days uh, for 40 days of prayer for our youth ministry. Our website has a prayer guide 
that gives daily prayer prompts between now and Christmas Eve. And we encourage you to join with us and together, let's plant seeds of prayer for our teenagers and watch with anticipation of what God will do. Well, until next Sunday, I want you to know that my prayer for you today comes out of the book of Isaiah, who says this, When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. And New Hope, with those words, may you be encouraged to know that you are dearly loved.